Okay, we are now live on Facebook. Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening. These are moments that uh, we have all been waiting for. And I'm really, really glad uh, to be the one to be hosting uh, these uh, wonderful guests and a very, very uh, amazing topic as well that you shall be getting to handle tonight. Yes, and uh, just to our viewers, good evening. Uh, greetings to all of you, our audience. It's always a pleasure to host you uh, once again on Sadref Africa platform. And this is a platform where we say, uh, or we believe that a broken crayons still color. It doesn't matter the kind of uh, brokenness um, you could have been crushed before, but this is where we uh, hope is restored. I welcome you all to this segment. We call it a brighter day segment. Mm -hmm. And this is a monthly conversation that takes place every last Friday of the month. We cover different relevant topics uh, and uh, that are based on real and authentic stories. Uh, and this is for the purpose of uh, creating awareness to give hope and also uh, transform lives. Uh, remember that we are live on Sadref Africa Facebook page. So feel free to host watch parties. Uh, you could share on your timeline and also invite someone to this conversation. And if you want to know more about Sadref Africa, kindly check uh, our website that is www.sadref.com. And uh, you could as well uh, like and follow our Facebook page that is Sadref Africa. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, Sadref Africa. And also uh, we have an Instagram handle that is Sadref underscore Africa. Thank you, thank you. Now to uh, all our audience, I want to invite all of you today to this conversation. What I say, this conversation is just not uh, for, uh, for us alone. Uh, we also invite you. So kindly uh, feel free to engage by going to the chat box, uh, put your conversation, put your comments, your thoughts, uh, your concern, and also maybe your experience. Uh, we shall be sampling uh, with our guests uh, as we proceed. And uh, I want to uh, really acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, our guest, Jackie. And I know in a few, uh, Robert will be joining in. So we shall keep, uh, we, we shall get started as Robert joins in. So uh, kindly uh, continue with the conversation, put in your questions or whatever you have and we will uh, sample and try to uh, respond to many as we can. Now to our discussion uh, this night, and this is an observation uh, by, I'll start by an observation by a psychologist that I found somewhere. And he talked of, of one of the major reasons among us others that makes dating difficult for over 40s uh, is uh, because this type of uh, this category of people they tend to take dating too seriously and what uh, he said uh, if you are looking for a serious relationship in your 40s you could be approaching dating with a bit too much intensity making dates feel more like an interview than a chat uh, with a potential match if you are heading into a date with a checklist of questions and criteria you are running the risk of making the person feel interrogated and unseen for who they are. Keep it as casual and relaxed as you possibly can. And don't beat yourself up too much if you are feeling anxious. And that is a, a, a suggestion by uh, Carissa uh, Carlston, who is a clinical psychologist. And she added that, just try and let the conversation flow. Chemistry will either form or it won't. Yeah, I found that uh, observation to be very uh, funny, Jackie. So I had to start with it. And um, the, my name is Jenny Washira, and I'm your host today. And uh, today we are on episode three of season two. And the topic is uh, of discussion that we have is uh, uh, the challenges of dating in your 40s. 
And together uh, with me, I'm privileged to host super amazing panelist, uh, who is Jackie Othoro, and uh, also Robert will be joining us. And they will help us to unpack and uh, explore the topic of discussion tonight. And uh, maybe to start us off, I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Jackie so that uh, she gets to introduce herself uh, to us so that we get to know more uh, yeah, about her. Karibu sana, Jackie. Well, thank you, Jenny. Thank you for having me uh, on your show. And um, it's, it's exciting to be having this conversation. It's one of those challenging ones that you never know which way it's going to go, but um, I hope that we will have just an exciting time having a discussion around dating in your 40s and for some of us in our 50s. Well, I am a pastor here in the city of Nairobi. I, I minister and I serve at the Ruach Assemblies under the leadership of Reverend Julian Kula. And so he's my senior pastor and, um, and it's, uh, it's a joy to be here. I have been in um, the ministry for almost 22 years now. 22 years I've been serving in, in ministry in uh, different uh, churches within this city. Uh, but I'm also a trained coach, a transformation coach. Um, and um, I, I enjoy having conversations with women who are older in life and are single and are open to whatever possibilities life may throw you away. So that's a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm sure a little bit more will, will come to the fore as we have our conversation. But it's so good to be here with you this evening. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, Jackie, for that. And uh, just to um, uh, bring us all uh, to speed, uh, there are different ca uh, categories that you are looking at, you know, uh, uh, 40 plus, and this one I want to believe is uh, 40 plus, 40 uh, be and beyond. And uh, we have people who are looking for a first time forever match. We also, we have people who are re-entering the scene after a divorce or breakup. And also we have those that are, uh, they're having kids, perhaps bringing them up by themselves or co-parenting co and others who don't have kids and others who may still want to have kids. And also we have others who are seriously uh, pursuing their careers and their goals are very clear. So just looking at all these uh, uh, kind of people, maybe Jackie to start us off, does the love game get complicated as you age? Wow, that, that, that's a loaded question <laughs> because of the different categories that you just mentioned, you know, uh, because when you're older, there are the more variety of ways you enter back into the dating pool. You know, usually when you're younger in your 20s, you know, you're usually already single, probably never having married, never had a relationship before, and you're starting out. But as you get older, they tend to be a lot more opportunities for you to have had a previous or a past um, relationship, whether it was a successful one that ended up in safe, you know, unfortunately death, so you become a widow, or whether it's one of those that ended up in a divorce, or maybe it was just a long-term relationship without marriage and you finally broke up, or as you said, you know, never really been in any serious relationship and you're starting out. So is it challenging to step into the dating pool at the age of 40 plus? I think so. You know, it, it, are you able to hear me? Oh, okay, sorry. I thought I thought you were saying something. Yeah, it is a little bit more challenging because um, I think we're a bit more cautious. You know, you've seen life. You've um, you've journeyed through the different uh, stages of of relating. You know, may, maybe you've had a number of breakups. Uh, maybe you've been for quite a while, not really. You know, going out onto the dating scene. So yes, you know, in many ways, it does get a little bit more challenging, a little bit more complicated when you when you get older. And I think for me, one of the most, um, the, the, the biggest area, I guess, of struggle, if I would say that, is that when you're older, you're so more set in your ways. You know, you're not as flexible uh, as when you were younger. You know, you don't accept uh, as much as you would have, you know, <laughs> when you were younger and you're both young, you know, in your 20s and trying to just figure out this whole dating uh, scene. But when you're in your 40s and in your 50s, you, you've pretty much carved out a life that you are content with in many situations and it's it's not that easy to to create space for someone else you know uh, uh, at an older place so yeah i think it has a bit more unique challenges 
Wow, wow. I hear you, uh, Jackie, mm -hmm. and uh, also to our audience, if you are joining us, uh, our topic of discussion today is uh, about our challenges that uh, uh, the 40 plus get to experience while on the dating scene. And our guests tonight are uh, Reverend uh, Jackie Othoro and uh, Robert Burale, who will be joining us shortly. And so uh, we continue with our discussion. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I had lost the internet. You can hear me, Jackie? Yes, I can hear you now, yes. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. I think I lost internet uh, a bit, okay. That's so, uh, Jackie, yes. Uh, I think when I started there, there's some observation from a clinical psychologist, and they talk, and uh, she talked about uh, forty plus um, uh, age. You know, uh, people who fall under that category, they tend they tend to take uh, this dating thing too seriously. What is your yeah. view about that? <laughs> I was actually laughing to myself because I thought maybe I'm the one who wrote that piece. Because it does sometimes feel like you are going through an interview because, you know, you're thinking, okay, does he, you know, I've got this checklist. And, and unfortunately for us women, the, the older we go, the longer our checklist becomes. You know, we're getting a bit more fussy, more finicky. Um, and and, and we, we really have this very long checklist and, and, and we're ticking off this person. Does he fit in all these um categories and when you finally do go out on a date it almost feels like let's get rid of all the preliminaries i don't have too much time to waste i am getting older time is passing so let me just get and ask those difficult hard questions so that we can really get into you know knowing who you are and and it, it makes for let me just say an interesting maybe sometimes awkward conversation because there's nothing um you, you you've stripped it of it of its organic nature you know mm -hmm. of just getting to know someone um, I remember I did see um, a questionnaire that says, if you spend um, four hours with one person asking these 36 questions, you're almost guaranteed to fall in love at the end of that time, because there's some very deep and very personal questions that you dive right into. And it was done as an experiment and a couple tried it who'd never met before. And four hours later, they had you know, emotional feelings for each other because of the depth of the questions. But um, we don't know how that would then last the long, you know, the long term, you know, once you, you know, life gets into into play and you begin to live life, you know, would, would all those intense emotions be able to sustain you into um, a, a relationship that is stable, that is long term. So, yes, you know, we do get into that space because we want to hurry up the process. We don't want to date, you know, if you're 45, if you're 50, you don't want to date for five years. You know, you want to speed up the process. So you think I might as well ask those hard questions that would normally take me five, six year, uh, months before I ask it. Let me ask it now. Get it out of the way. So, yeah, I think sometimes we do fall into the trap of uh, being more like an interview than a relationship. <laughs> what? Well, that is tough. We even uh, there's one of our uh, viewers who is agreeing with you and she's saying, hi, Reverend Jackie, it's more complicated. You are sure about what you want. So aren't seen as flexible or uh, mm. malleable. You are set in your ways. So many negative outcomes that is divorced from our age mates who also kind of discourage you. Uh, so we are super cautious. And yes. that's now it tells me now what you have explained, you know? <laughs> exactly. And it's interesting because, you know, the way the world has gone, you know, I've got a lot of my friends who are going through divorce. You know, they got married in their mid 20s, late 20s, and they're going through their divorce, you know, season now. I, I, I could count a, a good number of them, you know, off my fingertips. And, and they are coming to an end of a relationship while you are contemplating being on the starting end, uh, you know, of the beginning of one. And, and, and so watching what they're going through, their pain, the challenges, some of them, you know, the mistakes that they did that got them to that place, it really causes you to pause and say, okay, if I'm gonna go in at this late stage, 
you know, and I'm watching my friends who've been married for 20 years, 25 years, and they are experiencing some really fundamental challenges that, you know, is causing many of them to break up and to go their separate ways. It causes you pause. You know, you, you, you are no longer, you know, footloose and fancy free. You, you are a little bit more cautious about where you're going because the reality of life is that people break up and, and at this late stage in life, you, you don't want to walk into discomfort. You know, getting into a relationship mm -hmm. that starts off on the wrong footing or that you can't um, erroneously put some guarantees because there are no guarantees for relationships. But I think at uh, our older age, we almost want to have some guarantees. And um, and then you look at people around you and you say, what can I do to protect myself from an eventuality like that? Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. That's so deep, Jackie. That's so deep. And there's a, a perception or, um, uh, okay, like, uh, is it too hard to deal with changes for the fact that your life is usually more settled? And then getting, you find like, a, a, a maybe the whole thing becomes so complicated since you have uh, this new person who maybe will come and introduce you to new things and you've been set in your path for long. Is it the, one of the factors that makes it so difficult? Hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, if you've been living, you know, you leave uh, college maybe in your early 20s, 2021, and you've been living on your own, and you've hit your 40s, you've hit your 50s, you've been living alone and, and creating a life for yourself, especially if you've never been married before, uh, for almost 30 years, you know, you, you've crafted a world for yourself, you know, that um, you are answerable primarily to yourself. But also, I would imagine that those who've been married before, you know, and maybe either are widowed or um, divorced, they already have a template of a life with someone else, you know, and you're trying to now fit in somebody new into a different way in which you've lived. I, I know of people who, um, you know, maybe lost a, a wife and, and, and they remarry and the, and the new wife has to fit into the mold of of the former wife you know everything in the house is left the same things are not changed they live in the same house you know and so it's a it's a big readjustment and i and i've i've I heard of um a particular couple um who were much were pretty mature the man was a widow the woman had never married before and um she just told him point blank if you're gonna have a life together i need you to build me a new house i can't live in the house that you lived with your wife you know, you had a good marriage, you know, you had kids, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm much more older now. It's unlikely I'll have children. You need to get me a new house so that you and I can begin a life that is separate from what your previous life was. So yes, there are a lot of adjustments that uh, people need to make uh, when we're much older. You know, I, I look at the young ones that we take through uh, premarital counseling and we prepare them and, and they've got stars in their eyes and for them, everything is like, hey, what will be, will be. If we're eating spaghetti every day, that's fine. You know, if we sleeping on a mattress without a bed, that's okay. You know, but when you're 45, 50, um, you know, there's a little bit more, more structure and discernment that you want in your relationship. So, yeah, it's a lot, it's, it's, it's definitely wow, wow. It's harder to put someone else in the picture. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those insights, Jackie. I can see now we are joined by our other guests. That's uh, Coach Robert Burale. Welcome so much, Coach. We've been waiting for you. We are continuing with the conversation, uh, which today is a, we are talking about uh, the challenges that come uh, with uh, uh, dating at the age of uh, 40 uh, plus. So you are so much welcome. We've uh, Thank you. tried to handle. Yes, Karibu Sana. Yeah. So, uh, and I know Jackie, as you, you spoke, uh, there's something you mentioned about uh, maybe being in the space of uh, uh, the, the people who come in uh, divorced and uh, or maybe widowed and they need to get to that uh, uh, dating scene once again. And uh, so I would want to, uh, maybe we look at the divorce factor in this uh, uh, manner, how uh, it makes it uh, so complicated because maybe of uh, the past experience, maybe of what you went through and you fear being there again, 
or rather feeling that uh, you've been out of uh, practice uh, for some time. So you feel it's a lot of uh, work again uh, coming to the uh, dating scene. Or, uh, yeah, so you've been out for long. So maybe, uh, uh, Robert, we will uh, uh, welcome you uh, with that question. Maybe you can tell us why is it too, too complicated or a challenge for people who've gone through separation, divorce, or people who are widowed, uh, feeling like uh, they should come back to the dating scene? Well, first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, and I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Yes. And it's also an honor to share this podium with the great Reverend Jackie, a woman I really do honor and respect. Um, dating after divorce, and of course, if we look at the balance of life, it's 40 and above, really, is not the easiest, uh, because as you rightly said, we, for my case, I, the fear of getting it wrong. We say when you get to a certain age, you don't have time to make another mistake, you understand? So it makes us become very skeptical and we operate on the parameters of fear. Like what if I get it wrong again? You know, do I have it in me to get it wrong again? And normally the answer is no. And that is also risky. As much as you're trying to take care of our heart, it's also risky. You may miss out on people who really deserve to be with you or you deserve to be with them for happiness because of fear, you understand? And, and um, what will people say? I mean, uh, uh, if I did make it the first time, what do I have it in me? And, and when you start dating, and I'm sure many people will say this, and for ladies especially, if you date a divorced man, your so-called boardroom friends pull you on the side and they start whispering, are you sure? Do you have to date a divorced man? Are you sure? There are many, many, many men out there who don't, uh, who have never been in a marriage. Um, are you sure you want to be in a relationship with somebody who has a child or children? So we get to a place where we feel, I'm going to step back and just watch it. And fear makes divorced people take time and time goes and you can never redeem, you can never recover time, you can only redeem time. What about the people who are over 40 and not, never been married before? Uh, people tend to ask, wait, wait, what were you doing all those years? At least you should have been in a marriage. At least you should have had three broken engagements. So there must be something wrong with you. And, so, and it's not necessarily the case. People are just taking their time. They're building themselves. In fact, I would, I would go as far as saying some of these people who have not been married uh, beyond 40 could actually be the most solid people if you enter into a relationship with them. It's because they would not take nonsense. You understand what I'm saying? And, and after 40, uh, madam, we don't have time for games. If you're a 40-year-old man or woman and you're asked on a date, stop praying for 40 days and fasting. Time is of the essence as well. <laughs> so quickly, and, and, and you don't have time for nonsense or for small games when somebody calls and says, I love you, or you love me too, I love you more. You, no, they, you don't have, you know, it's bring your case on the table and let's handle this thing. We are going or we are not. <laughs> That's a long introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <man. laughs> Thank you for, for bringing in a very new perspective, uh, uh, Coach Robert. And I think uh, one thing I agree, you know, at uh, getting to 40, you've already uh, maybe made your mistakes and you didn't get, uh, uh, you want to get somebody who'd waste your, your time. So I want to agree with so many things that you have said. And maybe even the aspect of uh, fear, you're getting, you're fearing also to get it wrong again and maybe waste more time. So you'd rather, uh, use more time and there's a question that uh, we addressed before you, you came of talking about uh, like uh, 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 people 40 years plus they take uh, this dating thing so seriously is like you it's like an interview you know you are you're coming with all the list of what you want you know so sometimes you might even put off the uh, somebody with potential what do you think about that you know you've come with that list of this you know tick 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 and then you end up maybe losing that person who uh, you could have been uh, compatible with. Sorry, I think I lost you a bit. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I can hear you now. Go you on. You can hear me now. Yes. Uh, yeah. You are talking the aspect of uh, before you came in, we had a, a discussion of um, uh, 40 plus, you know, uh, taking this dating thing too seriously to a point, you know, you come with a, a list of the things that you want or how you want things done. 
and in the process you could end up losing a potential person you know so how do you again separate that so that you don't get to lose that person who maybe you could have uh, is compatible to you and uh, again uh, with you being very uh, firm or rather uh, very strict with exactly what you want You, uh, it seems you, you can hear me, Jackie. It seems frozen. Myself? Or, or yeah, uh, you, Robert? You, I can hear. No, you keep to be, you, you free, you've been freezing. But I think I made out of uh, what you said. Uh, okay. Dating over 40, you come with a list of the things you want. We take it very seriously. I'm sure that's what you're saying. And, and we do that because honestly, we are not 23. At 20, there are some things you can do. You understand? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. At 20, there are so many mistakes you're allowed to make. At 25, you can make some mistakes. But when you get to a place of 40 and above, really, you do, you want to eliminate the jokers very, very early. Uh, you don't want a, a trial and error kind of thing. You want to know someone's uh, value system short-term, mid-term, and long-term values and plans so that you have every information to make an informed decision. And I'm not saying we become too serious as if we are, we are applying for a visa to Israel or America. No, we also need to have some fun and, and uh, be risk takers, but we have to take calculated risks. There are some careless risks that you can take at the age of 22. After 40, Risks can be taken, but calculated risks because you can't you can't be dating somebody who will waste your five years. You understand what I'm saying? And then mm -hmm. they tell you after five years, ah, it's not you, it's about me. I think I need to move on. And then you go back to the playing field. And then you at 49, you're also now dating somebody else. And then at 53, they have left. And then we become a, a desperate. You understand what I'm saying? But we have to understand some things that we cannot be in a place where we have time like we had the 20s. So if we get a bit serious, not too serious, it's because we are in that stage of being serious. Wow, wow. That's a very, very deep insight. Uh, to our viewers, uh, continue putting in your question, your comments, your experience. Thank you, Maggie or Teatro, I can see you uh, and your comment. Thank you, uh, J JP Danba and Moi Wakangede. Kindly keep your comments, your questions coming. Our topic of discussion today is the challenges of uh, dating in your 40s, and that is 40s and uh, uh, beyond. And our guests tonight are Reverend Jackie Othoro and Coach Robert Burale. And maybe uh, we have to bring in this thing of technology because we know we are in the era of technology. And then we have this over 40 daters, and you know uh, the challenge that come with te uh, technology. Maybe Reverend Jackie, you can give a comment on that. Uh, what has technology contributed to the uh, difficulties in dating uh, for the 40 years plus? 40 plus. Well, I, I don't know whether I want to say difficulties. I, I'd say it's given us different options. You know, options that maybe we didn't have before of using, um, you know, the internet, uh, internet dating, all these different sites of meeting people. You know, you hear someone has DM'd you on your, you know, Facebook or your Instagram, and uh, people are using, you know, um, and you know, this social media really to get to meet people. Um, it's got two sides for me, you know. One is it broadens your 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 pool, for lack of a better word. You know, if I look at myself, if, if I'm to stay within my circles, you know, in my forties and fifties. One, just about everybody that I know is already married or going through a divorce or separation or, you know, there's just, they're, they're settled, you know. So if I'm supposed to broaden my, uh, my pool of uh, options, then I have to go further afield than where I am. And that's where the challenge comes in, that the reality is that you may have to do that. But the challenge is that we are like, I'm super cautious to put myself out there. Now, I am the kind of person who's very, I take risks. I, I have to try things, you know? So I have gone onto all these websites. I have gone, I'll put my name there, put my criteria, what I'm looking for. And after you start seeing the kind of people that are responding to you, you chicken out and true, you close your account. 
So I've, I've given it a go. And I, I know many um, of my friends who've actually met on, on dating you know, sites and have actually gotten married and they are, you know, they were marrying in their forties and they met people and they're, and they're, they've got good marriages. So it's, um, it's both a plus because it's this availability of new ways of relating, but it's a negative because it is such a different world from when we were in our twenties. And, you know, the date we, we used to use, um, that aerogram letter, you know, that you've sprayed with perfume and you've sent to the guy that you like and you wait for three weeks for it to come back to you and then you read that thing and read it over and over until it's tattered i mean that's that's what we were in our 18 uh, 18 19 20 25. we had no internet we had no email and and it was a slow mail and so the way we related them was very different but with the modern world and the internet i think the options are great i would i would tell anybody if you want to, you know, expand your horizons, don't be, don't be shy. Don't be afraid, you know, think through the kind of website you want to go to, you know, where you're likely to find the kind of people that um, um, are more in your, maybe the kind of people you want to hang out with. So if you're a Christian, you know, look for the Christian website, you know, because um, they're there and, 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 and try and make a connection, but don't shy away from it. This, this is the world we live in. You know, um, last the last two years showed us that people met and related online before they got married because we were locked down. We weren't going out. We weren't having our coffees and our dinners. So the world has changed. I would just say, even if in our 40s, 50s, explore the new options that are available, but just be smart about it. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jackie. So uh, from your side, this, we just uh, attempt this thing because now we've all gone modern. We've gone into the uh, online era. So we try it, but to, uh, to be cautious about uh, how we go about it. Maybe we can hear uh, views from uh, Robert, maybe your experience or your thought about uh, online and just the uh, this technology era compared to those days when we could actually physically be there, you know? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't add, add much to what Robert has said because she's captured it very well. Uh, but just a little bit is yes, we were in our 20s, we were in the era of writing letters and uh, applying for us men, vaseline on your lips and then kissing the envelope and, and then writing, I miss you. And then you wait for a reply like desperately. Um, there was a little bit of fun in that time. Uh, the risk about the digital era now, you may be 40 talking to somebody who is 16, 17, 18, and they're passing themselves as if they're 47. So you've got to be very, very careful in this day and age. And just like Reverend here, I'm also a risk taker. Um, I'm a bit more careful now because I have people who try to set me up by sending me inboxes uh, so that they can send them to the blogs. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we just have to open ourselves to a place where we also need to date. Um, yes, I have been personally set up by a few people and... Uh, Later, they came and told me, yes, we had been sent by this person so that we take the screenshots and then we click bait and we make it trend and all that. Yeah, so in this day and age, uh, when we get to our age, as Reverend said, it's people who are getting already married, some who are going through divorce separation. And, and um, so we also have to put ourselves out there for these nice meetings and uh, uh, couples, uh, singles uh, meetings for the church and all that. And, and I also think that um, people organize singles meetings. We tend to forget the 40 and above. We are just looking at 20s and early 30s. So we need to get to a place where we have the 40s and above, the separated, the, the, the divorced, and uh, 40, 50, 55, 60. I mean, we all need love. And whereby we can have a mature discourse, even the speakers there will not just come to say, Ikibamba sana wa pinduru. No, it's coming to discuss very important issues that, that are in line with where we are in our life. So the digital era has come and uh, brought new things into it. We have to be there. We can't ignore it because that's where we are now. But at our age, we just have to be a bit more careful than other people. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that yeah. thought. Yeah, right. maybe I, uh, I may read a, a few comments from our, our viewers. Uh, Mutindi is saying another challenge is uh, blending with someone who lost likely um, has kids and you, you don't or you do. 
These are two different families with different family cultures coming together and finding common grounds and dealing with the other parent is a challenge. I would like we pick it from uh, uh, what Mutindi has put across because another challenge uh, that we find is about the kid factor. Maybe uh, even you find at some uh, relationship, the children are the ones who determines, you know, who you should date when and how, uh, especially when they are a bit older. And also another fear, even with uh, the parents, you know, uh, especially the uh, the age that uh, the, the growing uh, age of uh, uh, children. How do you bring in a new person into your house and all that? So I would like maybe some inputs uh, as far as that is concerned, because it's a big challenge that even stops the uh, forty plus, especially those with children, to actually take that bold step of uh, going to the dating scene. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll start with you, Jackie. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that I've, I've sat in conversations with mothers who have uh, children and um, particularly either preteen and teenagers. And it's a, it's a really sensitive time. And um, when you when you're thinking of bringing a new person into your life, you know, you're beginning to date, you're seeing somebody else. This is not be a father, you know, uh, and, and they begin to ask questions, you know, who is this person? Some children get very sensitive and it gets very difficult for for a parent to actually have a relationship when they have children in the home. And I've, I've heard some wisdom from many, many mothers in particular who have, you know, just said, you know, this is a season for my children. Let me focus on them. Let them, I mean, they'll be leaving the home maybe five, six, seven years time. And then I can revert back and focus on myself because then they'll be older. They'll be able to accept somebody else coming into your life and you can be able to have um, a more, um, a more rounded and full family without disrupting the lives of your younger children. So I've, I've heard those, you know, those kind of conversations where they say, let's put the children first and then we can, you know, we can then um, go out and date later. But then there's, uh, you know, situations because everything is, is, is different and everybody has to figure out what works for them. And I think the only advice I'd give anyone who has children, you know, whether it's one, one side of the relationship or it's both sides, um walk with caution walk with caution have open discussions take your time before you introduce your children to the person that you're seeing you know because there's nothing worse than introducing you know your children to someone that you think this is my new forever you know partner and then six months later it's broken off and maybe broken off acrimoniously and a lot of tension is happening so take your time you know before you introduce your children to someone that you're potentially seeing, because you really need to protect protect kids in this day and age from uh, from from uh, just the vagaries of relationships. So that would be my would be my uh, would be my take. If you if you if you don't want to have children as well, you're one side of the partner. Then be careful. Don't get involved with somebody who has children, because you can't you can't alienate their children. So you got to be clear. And that's a bit about being older. You tend to know exactly what you want, you know? Okay. I know people who are so clear, they are 40, 41, 42, and they're very clear, they don't want children, you know? So would they marry somebody with kids? Possibly, yes. But if that person wants children from them, they're very clear, like, no, I'm happy to, to parent you, you, you know, your children with you, but I don't want to have my own children. And so these are the conversations around children that must be had, which is why I like what, what you were saying, coach. You don't have time to waste, you know, saying lovey-dovey here. No, get to some hard questions sooner than later because, you know, it, you, you can't walk into someone's space and then just tell them, well, I'm not interested in having children or even mothering or fathering someone else's children. You've got to be clear in the beginning. With kids, guys, let's not, let's not play games. Those lives are too precious to be messed up, yeah. Wow, wow. Thank you. Thank you for that, jo uh, uh, um, Reverend Jackie just telling us to be a bit cautious when it gets to children and uh, get to know exactly what you want and have those hard conversations before you get into that relationship. I'd also want to hear from a man's perspective about uh, uh, children. Kid factor. Right. Um, for example, I do have a, have a daughter. She's 16, turning 17. Um, I would not waste time with anybody who does not feel my, my daughter? I mean, my daughter will play a major role. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, if I start dating somebody and I feel they are not feeling my daughter and they don't want my daughter in that space, I, I don't care even if she looks like a Mexican goddess, she will have to go. 
You understand what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. having a child plays a major role in who you will date and who you will marry eventually, you know? Um, you can't be dating somebody, gossiping your daughter, saying this or this girl, this or... No, 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 no. I mean, that is my daughter. She expects me to protect her. And and when you get to a place where you are a parent and uh, you, were, you go into the dating scene, it's no longer about you. You are coming with somebody else. Somebody may be good for you because you like them tall, dark and handsome. You like them hips that don't lie. But the moment you realize, you know, you don't realize, you know you have a child or children, it's not an entirely one person's decision. They may be good for you because that's the kind of man or woman you like, but now what if they're not good for your child? There's a case we had, uh, thankfully my daughter has grown, but there's a case that uh, happened us uh, sometime in the recent past where a lady started dating this man. And this man was appeared to be very good with a child and all that. And sometimes ladies fall for this. Yeah. Sometimes men may act like they love your children, but it's just because they want to get to your heart. So what happened, this lady then trusted this man completely. And one time she went for a chama meeting and uh, left the daughter who was uh, 80, years, I think, with the man, you know, take care of my daughter. Now it's our daughter. And I'm going for my meeting with the ladies. I'll come back. And this man molested and raped this child. You understand what I'm saying? So you've mm. got to understand if you're dating and you have a child, he may be good for you. She may be good for you. But if she or he is not good for your child, you have a decision that you have to make. So children, you can't ignore. You have a major, they have a major, major part to play. And as Reverend say, you go to death, somebody who says, okay, fine, I don't want children, but I am willing to help you raise your children. If that is not forthcoming for any single parent, you just say, it's been real, goodbye, and you move on. In fact, don't, don't just move on. Put your feet on your shoulders and run, and run very fast. <laughs> you know, one I of the things that, um, yes, Jackie? But that I, I so agree with what you're saying, uh, Coach, is that you can't be so desperate to want to get into a relationship that you jeopardize the safety of your children. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, whether it's emotional safety, whether it is, is their physical safety. You know, the world is full of predators who are just waiting to prey on your children. And yes, I get it. People can get lonely. They want, you know, a, a life partner. They want to have the, the comfort of having a husband or a wife. But, oh, I'd rather you err on the side of cautiousness, you know, um, yeah. than have that story of where you leave your child in the care of someone and they molest violently that child. That child is scarred for life. You know, yes. um, just for because you, you were looking for a partner. So, uh, you know, caution. Some people may think, well, maybe not, um, you know, being a bit too too strict about it, but not with children. I think the, the world is, is dangerous enough for children as it is. Don't bring the danger into your home. If you're not sure, just just don't get that's involved. Yeah. Wow, wow. I think that's very, very uh, key. Uh, what uh, even uh, Robert has said, if she or he is not good for you, for your children, then he or she is not good for you. So uh, this is where if you have children, your, your children, they play a very big uh, part as far as uh, you making that decision is concerned. I think that's very, very key just for the safety of your children as well, so the, that, that you don't get uh, emotionally carried away and you forget about your children. I read some few comments from our viewers. Um, Rose um, Bai is saying, the most unfortunate thing is as you wait for the right one, you take forever in the name of uh, um, perfection. I think everything in life is a, a risk business. Open your eyes and risk moving on. Twende to Kisonga. So yeah. <laughs> that's from Rose. Um, uh, Maggie is saying at 40, you are fortified. Yeah. So uh, that's a new name, 40, fortified. So that's a great <laughs> a, a name that we've learned there. Don't come with a checklist, come with a bucket list. Maggie is saying so. And yes, my fear is making another mistake at my age. I would rather remain single, but can't afford dramas in my life. Yeah, those are different um, perspectives from our uh, viewers. And maybe to uh, expound on that, and uh, many of the things that uh, even we get to hear out there, like uh, over, over 40 plus, you have already set your path, and then you get to a point of setting your expectations too high. Could it be 
one of the reasons that makes it so complicated for, uh, for us because we have set the bar unrealistically high and then getting to a point also, uh, maybe just combining it with the priorities, you know, the priorities ha have changed. And uh, maybe at the beginning, you know, you could really, it was about a, a, a loving with your heart, but now it's loving with your brains. Mm -hmm. And um, like Kevin uh, Daphne said, people in their 40s and beyond have already had their fair tale, you know, wedding and uh, subsequent uh, divorce. They don't have the same urgency or uh, enthusiasm when it comes to finding a mate as they did in the past. Their top priorities are more likely maybe their children, their careers, maybe taking care of their uh, parents. Your views about that? Can come in, Robert. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we, we, we can't dismiss people over 40 because they've already had their time. As long as you're still alive, we are relational beings. In fact, the older you get, the more sensitive you become in wanting to get older with somebody. You know, actually, my take is the, the younger you are, you really are still enjoying your, your, your time. When you get to a certain age, you start thinking, you, you, you start thinking beyond going for ice cream. You start thinking beyond having sex for nine hours nonstop. Then you get into a place of companionship. You get into a place of fulfillment. You get in a place of looking for purpose. Where, what are we going to do? What legacy are we going to leave? You understand what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. So there's an urgency. And yes, we have to have very high expectations. It is just the truth. Because if you lower your expectations, you're putting yourself at a high risk of wasting your time. So what am I saying? I mean, <laughs> when you get to a, a, an age of a 40 and a, a, a young man or a young woman comes and all they're telling you, oh, honey, are we going clubbing tonight? Are we going to take some shisha tonight? I mean, go and play in the smaller league for that kind of nonsense. You understand what I'm saying? Well, we have to think about what investments are we going to make? If you have children, if some one of them are it's a blended family, what are, where are our children going to study? Do we have an investment for them that when we are long gone, they'll be sorted? What inheritance are we leaving them? So yes, I actually expect when we get to a certain age, you do not compromise. Actually, your expectation should be very high. And I know that's why people ask you people, why are you taking long to get married? It's because you are eliminating the jokers who seem to be the majority in the playing field. So anybody over 40, kudos if your expectations are high. In fact, I urge you to take them a notch higher because in this day and age, we have small people, they're called bentens, looking for people who are over 40 and they think they're desperate to just give them some good sex. Yeah. Life is beyond that. And we're looking for some young girls looking for bubabas because you have white hair. You say, okay, fine, this guy does not have the strength in the, in the bedroom, uh, but he will give me money for my weave. Nonsense. We have, we have now to get to a place where we are thinking legacy. We are thinking future. We are thinking uh, partnership. We are thinking death. That at 60, once a year, we'll be going on holiday, sit by the beach, read books, and just walk holding each other. At 20, they can go twerking in the clubs if they want. Their waist can still do that. <laughs> Their back can still hold to that. But no, after 40, after 50, kudos. Let your expectation be very high because we don't want to waste time. Wow, wow. <laughs> By the coach, take even your expectation are not high. Yeah, you know, wasting of time and no entertaining. Um, you know, the jokers is a way of eliminating them. Your view, Jackie, as uh, what Coach has said. Dare, dare I walk into that space? <laughs> yes, <laughs> made it perfectly clear. And I think it's it's true um, because at that age, you know, um, I got into trouble on NTV uh, some, some, sometime last year, I went on NTV, they're talking about people turning 30 and, and beginning to panic that they've not met their expectations and the goals that were set. And um, and they'd asked me to come in to talk as one who's older, you know, um, and 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 I, I made mention that I, I'm 52 and I'm single, you know, and the entire, that clip was put on, on, on their, on their, how should I put it, on, on their station and it, it, it just went crazy. 
uh, people found my number. People began to make propositions. It, it went as far as Nigeria. And I was being told, don't worry about your age. It's okay. I'm 36 and I can manage. You know, you know, you don't have to worry. And others were a bit on the on the not so kind side that, you know, you were very picky when you're younger. Therefore, you didn't, you know, you didn't, you, you, you lost all your opportunities now that you're old and withered. You're hoping to to find something. I mean, it was it was crazy streets. But one of the things that I, I realized at that point is that a lot of people fear growing older alone. And they don't understand how someone can say, I am older, I am alone, and I'm okay. It was it was a very difficult conversation for many people to have. And so their natural inclination was to say, we'll fix your problem by offering ourselves, you know? Uh, don't worry about age, don't worry about distance, don't worry that I may even have a wife already or someone else. Let me fix your problem by offering myself. And I think that's one of the challenges that um, that that people need to to understand that just because you you happen to be single older, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. Because unfortunately, when people equate that, that the fact that you haven't found a life partner uh, as an older person, then there's there's something that's wrong psychologically, mentally, socially. You're immature. You're picky, and they have all these categories because it makes the conversation easier for them. It makes them feel as if, you know, I am right in my understanding as opposed to you and your choices. So, yes, you know, should we be a bit more cautious? I think so. You know, by the time I'm in my 50s, I, I like Robert said, I am legacy. That's my phase. What am I leaving behind? What am I looking at in terms of my 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 retirement? You know, you've got maybe another 15 years of um, of of active work. Is that what you're going to be doing with your life, raising a family, as opposed to going on the beach and walking and, and sipping your, your drinks and reading books? You know, you've got some very serious choices to make at that point in time. For women, it could be a little bit easier because the biology kicks in and, you know, and you may not end up having the children. But for a man who marries and he's 60 and he marries someone who's 40, 30, you know, likelihood is that he'll be a father at that age. You know, and he's 60, while he's 70, he's got teenagers in the house. So the, yeah, Allow me just to interrupt shortly. Yes. I'm just going for an introduction on the news item, and I'll be back up in exactly one minute. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, you know, you've got to ask the question, what then in my later years, whatever you're going to call them, my golden years, my retired years, what, how will I be living my life? What quality of life? will I have? And, and and we must ask those questions. We can't avoid them and neither can we come to the place where we are made guilty or to feel guilty about choices, you know, that we've made. So I, I would say ask the hard questions, you know, um, much as the young men were offering themselves, you know, <laughs> to be my companion, uh, the question is what were they offering, you know? Um, mm -hmm. As Robert would nicely say, was it a companion only in the bedroom? Or what else were they offering? Because I think it's erroneous to think that somebody is um, single um, in their 40s and 50s and the only thing they're looking for is sexual companionship because that really isn't it. There's so much more that a person is looking for. So yeah, it's um, ask the hard questions. Don't shy away from them because unless you can make yourself, uh, you know, you're sure about what you want to live your life as, I don't think it is fair to brush to brush over some of these questions, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, one of the, of the things to take home that you said, Jackie, you know, as you're single, uh, an older single, it, it shouldn't look like uh, you have a, 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 a problem, especially it, it just yeah. to re really be content with uh, your singlehood and make positive uh, things out of it. Because again, when you tend to uh, be desperate, you'll get all those offers, as you're saying, and some right. offers for sure at your age and uh, your whatever, they're really not uh, working. As you said, exactly what are you bringing on the table? And there's something even uh, you have mentioned that I would want uh, we pick it up from, uh, from there about uh, uh, sexual expectation. So the question is, at midlifers, you saw the uh, the midlifers and sex is the focus different, you know, compared to uh, the younger age. 
Now, this is this is a question you should be asking when the coach is here because this is not up his alley. Uh, this one for me is like, Woo, what am I, what am I, what am I saying? I, you know. <laughs> He will get us going when he comes. He will come now with yes. his. Okay. He now, add on to what, yeah. my background is is biology. You know, that's that's what my my background training is before I I went into the pastorate. So I understand the human anatomy and the human uh, body and and what the human body does and needs. And you know, many people say, you know, if you talk to either psychologists and all, they they will tell you that. Um, a woman's uh, libido gets actually more strong and heightened the older she gets, you know. And some women in their menopause are actually a lot more um, active, I would say, than when they were in their childbearing years because they were tired looking after children. And now they are in their 50s and they don't have all those cares and concerns. And, you know, they've, they've crossed over and they have this new, new excitement, new energy, new verve for life and which is why you know you hear you know robert would probably talk about the cougars and all that who are looking for the younger men because the um it is said that the woman's sexuality can actually improve when she gets older so i i think um i would hazard a guess to say and i'm saying this very carefully lest i get taken to the floor um when it comes to one's sexuality when they're older i think it's still an individual story you know, it's what you have chosen and, and, and think about. You know, if you if you think you're over the hill and you're, you, you don't see yourself as a sexual being, then, you know, I hear sex begins in the mind. You will shut yourself down and you, you will think, well, I'm past beyond the cell by date and therefore I'm no good. But then you find others who, in their mind, they, they think, no, I'm still a, a, you know, an amazing, gorgeous woman. I have all the energy that I need. I am, you know, and, and they have active sex lives. So, you know, I, I think it's an individual, um, it's an individual journey, but you need to know yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I know that it's, it's never gonna happen for me again, I don't think it's right to put a poor man into that space by saying, yes, let's get married. Unless, you know, you both just want to be, you know, good companions for your later years in life. Again, don't shy away from the hard questions. <laughs> you know, and the good thing about being older, we can actually ask those questions. We can talk about those questions and say, yeah. you know, what, what are your expectations of me? You know, mm -hmm. I may not have the energy. I mean, Robert was saying your back is not as flexible. You know, I may not have the energy that I had when I was in my 20s and 30s. So what are your expectations? On what are my expectations? I think it's fair to have those discussions. And because we're old enough to have them, you know, let's have them. Mm -hmm. Talk to someone else who may help you figure it out. You know, uh, we're not as a, t a taboo field as in the past. You know, there are people that you can actually go and have these conversations with and and, and, and make up your mind about what, what are you looking for in that area. Hmm. Okay. Nice. But yeah, there's no nice. chandelier swinging and, and, and backs and, you know, bending over backwards. <laughs> that probably would be part of your, your repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> so you're encouraging, okay, this is an individual journey, as you're saying, Jackie. And uh, it's good to bring those hard conversations on the table yeah. as you get into yeah. those relationships, because at our age, again, you didn't uh, really risk doing it wrong. You know, you need just to have it clear, your expectation and the other person's expectations. And I'm, I'm hoping a uh, uh, coach will also catch up with, with that discussion, because I know it's a, a, an area that uh, we really want to hear his responses. And maybe before that, I would like to read some few comments from uh, our viewers. Uh, Ceci is saying, Thank you. Uh, I so needed this. I'm turning 40 and my life has just begun. My energy is double spiritually, physically, career and mental stability. I'm so getting married and glowing with my mate, Amina. Wow, hey. kudos, Stacey. That's very nice. That's very uh, nice of you. Yeah, and uh, Patty is saying, very true, it gets lonely when you are older and you badly need a companion in life. Yeah, that's a, a party. Yes, that's true. The children's safety comes first. They are agreeing with the sentiments we had at the mm. beginning about children. And also um, uh, a party saying, true, we need to protect our children in these relationships. Our mm. children come first. I think we are all agreeing to, uh, to that. And uh, Mutindi, there's a comment also. She's talking of in your 40s, you are most likely to meet someone who's been in a long-term relationship like marriage and you wonder how much 
probing you do to get the real reason for the end of the previous relationship. Otherwise, you have their side of the story, and most of the time, they'll blame the other person. So getting the truth is a challenge. Finding out if there are unresolved issues, drama. Are they amicable? Is there drama? Maybe you can comment something on that, uh, uh, Jackie. Yeah, um, I love Americans for this. They they have research on just about everything, you know, and they have statistics about different situations. And uh, I read something that once that said that um, the divorce rate in, in, in America is, is at about 50%. You know, I think we all are aware of that statistic. And it's across board. It doesn't matter whether people are religious, irreligious, it's, it's just the standard across, you know, the American population is at about 50%. But what was interesting was they said that the, the divorce rate is actually becomes higher, almost up to 70% for those people who have a second marriage, you know, and, um, and, and, and it's, it, 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 it makes sense. You can understand, you know, why that would be, especially if you haven't dealt with what caused the breakup of your first marriage, you know, and the same, uh, high statistic is given for people who have not actually had a formalized marriage that um you know they've been living together as partners for many years and then they do get married again that statistic of divorce is pretty high in that category of people and and the thing is this i think what what that research is basically uh, alluding to is that many people go into marriage a second time round without dealing with what caused the first breakup. You know, a, a lot of pain that people want to cover. You know, you found a new love, you want to start afresh. You know, you don't want to think about your past. You know, you don't want to face what, you know, maybe you were part of the problem, you know, in the marriage. It's easy to point fingers and blame the other partner. But it's, it's a situation where many people don't want to really face the pain and the hurt. And so they brush it over. You know, they say, I'm done with that marriage. We are divorced now. Good riddance. You know, I'm ready to start again. But if you don't deal with what caused the problem in the first place, you know, it'll it'll repeat again. Two of the, the biggest problems in marriages um, are things that people don't actually automatically think would be a cause of a breakup. And one is communication, poor communication. You know, um, if you get into conflict, how do you resolve your conflict? bad conflict management, all that is around the communication. And many marriages break up because people can't communicate properly. You know, uh, something is said, misunderstood, it grows, it festers. That's the one. The second biggest area is finances. You know, issues around money. You know, how people deal with money. Um, uh, is there enough of it? You know, one could be a, a, a spendthrift, the other could be frugal. And just the whole money situations you know, bring around a lot of conflict and many marriages don't survive. The third, the third large reason why marriages break up is, um, interestingly, not infidelity, but a loss of a child. Many people, especially if the loss of the child is a tragic loss, many people aren't able to process what that means for them and uh, how to get over it. And it, instead of bringing the family together, it pulls them apart. And so uh, it's one of those things that uh, people don't, aren't always aware of. And then there are hard things to talk about, you know, later. So you just hope that this person that you've met, you know, you'll be able to navigate uh, life again. And if you don't deal with it, you will have a problem in your second marriage. And um, it may look different. It may come up differently. But um, the statistics aren't very good if you don't deal with what caused the problems in the first place. And I think in, in Kenya, um, our society has matured to the point where people now know how to seek for help. You know, in our mother's generation, people didn't seek for help. You just humiliated in that marriage. You stayed in there and you hoped for the best. And when you and if it didn't work and you ended up separating or, and even divorcing, it was a private matter. You never sought any counsel. You didn't look for therapy. You didn't talk to your priest or your pastor. You just grin and bear it and hope for the best. But our generation is a little bit different. We are more open to talking. And the millennials behind us are even more so. They will seek our therapy very quickly. And there's a plus in that. The more you're able to talk about what your challenges have been, 
the sooner you will get the help that you need. So um, I, I, I used to be a member of a church that um, if, you, if you wanted to remarry, there was a very rigorous pro, uh, you know, uh, process that you followed. One of them being that you had to be at least seven years post-divorce before you'd consider marrying. Why? It's long enough for three things to happen. For you to heal, number one. Number two, for you to know that there's no, po they, there's no possibility of reconciliation. I mean, you've totally gone your separate ways. And then number three, for you to actually ask the hard questions as to why your marriage didn't work. And then when you finally you do meet someone and you want to get married, um, as opposed to the 12-week, 6-week, 5-week premarital counseling, it was recommended that you sit with a counselor for a full year. Okay, So you could really get deep into issues. Mm -hmm. And not just a marriage counselor, but a therapist. One that can really ask those hard questions. So that when you go back into it a second time, then you are a lot better prepared, you know, for the marriage the second time around. So, yeah, you can put some pretty high walls, you know, high standards to be able to help you. But I think the bottom line why a second marriage is struggle is because we've not dealt with the baggage and the problems that caused the failure of the first marriage. And that goes the same with if the marriage ended by death, because sometimes death seems like a cleaner cut. But what was the quality of their marriage before the spouse died? You know, some people can have a horrible marriage and then the spouse dies and all of a sudden that, that spouse is made a saint because they've now died. But while they were together, they were contemplating divorce, separation, there was abuse, there was violence. But the person dies and they become a saint. That's somebody who is not dealing with the reality of their marriage. And if they meet somebody else and get married to that person, they will carry all of that baggage into their new into their new marriage well a very pan, uh, a pertinent issue that you brought up reverend jackie mm -hmm. uh just uh, highlighting that uh, the rate of uh, divorce especially with the second uh, marriages tend to be very very high uh, for the reasons yeah. that um, uh, the people the parties did not take time to heal after the separation uh, mm -hmm. or divorce just for uh, for the reason maybe they do not want to address the pain, uh, they don't want to face the pain and actually process what happened and take time also to see how they contributed to the breakup and uh, all that. And, uh, and uh, there are also three things that you have pointed out that, that, that are very important as far as just having, um, getting into a better uh, relationship uh, and that is uh, or rather what has caused even the uh, the uh, the breakdown that's poor communication the issues around finances not having uh, good communication around it and also uh, something that i didn't know you talked of a loss of a child for me i think infidelity i would have said infidelity to be number one but this is something new that you have brought up which is uh, really really uh, important as well so uh, this is really uh, good and I can see uh, coach is back and uh, there's a question that has been waiting for you. You are like uh, this question, you will also answer it. Uh, Reverend Jackie has said you, <laughs> you <laughs> we need to I was hear holding, I was holding thought for you. You come back, you deal with it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. What question and, is this? Uh, <laughs> and this is about uh, the midlifers and sex. Is the focus different? The what? Uh, midlifers and sex, the uh, perspective of sex with uh, uh, 40 plus um, people, is the focus different compared to the younger ones? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. The younger people want to see how many people they can sleep with. The older people want the quality of the sex they will have. And and we at, at, you reach an age yes, where... Yes, it was, it was going to bring it on. Pardon? <laughs> I told her you were going to bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you get some young people sleeping around like rabbits, sweating like footballers after playing 120 minutes, extra time and penalty included. But when you get to a certain age, you're thinking about the quality. You're not excited with, uh, oh, let's try 75 positions. First and foremost, you'll try a position, then you go and mess your spinal cord. You understand what I'm saying? So we get to a place, you reach a certain age, and you don't have this time to play. And that's why people get shocked when people say, at a certain age, you're not all, all over having sex. And people are like, what do you mean? It's because now it's about the quality and not with just anybody, but the person who you will marry. It's as simple as that. But 
Young people now, let me tell you something, and I'll say this as it is. Young people meet after three days, they want to have sex because five days is a long-term relationship already. You understand? But when you get to a certain age, 40 is and a bar, it's not a, there's more to it. Before you get to the physical side of it, you connect mentally, you connect spiritually, you connect intellectually. It's not just about connecting in a club after having two beers and smoking shisha, strawberry and vanilla flavor. So you connect in a very higher realm. So the culmination in the bedroom is not per se, oh, we didn't do it for three hours. It's the quality and the connection that matters. In marriage, that's what I'm talking about. I'm an advocate of living a life of purity uh, by the grace of God. And once you get married, you have government permission and heavenly permission to do anything you want to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Coach, for the insights. And I think uh, this is very key uh, about uh, quality. You know, the 40 plus you get to a point is about quality and uh, also connection. It's not a matter of, of just a, a, a physical meeting in a day and up you are in it. So I, I think that is what we wanted to hear. <laughs> Jackie, a comment on that as, as, as we wind up, we have a uh, uh, few minutes. <laughs> I actually, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually gonna comment on that one because I, as I said, that one is this area, but I'd like to comment on something that I've seen um, somebody actually write um, on, on the chat. I, I just looked down and I saw this and it's, it's the church's response and attitude towards people who are divorced or going through a divorce and you know the pain that they go through, and 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 many times the church is seen as uh, I think if I was to quote one of the ladies who wrote it here, that the the church the church is actually very harsh, in the way we handle people who are going through um, yeah. divorce or who have been divorced. Um, as 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 a, as a reverend practicing pastor in a church, I will whisper this: Yes, it's true. Yeah. We haven't been the best. Uh, we haven't dealt with people well. Um, we we have um, condemned in many ways, made judgment. We have put very high um, burdens for the one going through the divorce to bear. And then in many cases, we've ostracized those who've gone through divorce. Now I'm speaking generally, you know, we do know that there are churches here who actually even have ministries that are catered towards people who are going through the pain of a divorce. Because there's one thing I will say categorically. Divorce is not a walk in the park. It is painful. It destroys the fabric of your soul. It destroys many relationships around you. Um, it, it, uh, it's like a, a, a tear or a scar on your psyche when right. one is going through divorce. Now, I obviously haven't gone through divorce because I've never been married, but I've had very close people and being a pastor, having had to walk with people who've gone through divorce, you know, I wouldn't want to wish it on my enemy, but I think as a church and, and, and I know there are many more churches that actually agree with this position that, um, biblically divorce is permitted you know um in in, in even in scriptures uh there, there are situations and circumstances that the bible is clear that says you know for infidelity for example you know you you have the permission to to walk away from that marriage i would add you know violence abuse of any kind you know is grounds for you to to walk away the the, the narrative of vumilia and stay in a marriage that could cost you your life we have buried people who stayed in marriages and were killed by their spouse or took their own life. So the narrative around, um, around divorce and the church is one that needs to keep on happening. You know, uh, as, as, as a minister of the gospel, my text for this is, you know, is the Bible. You know, what, is, what does the Bible say towards marriage? What does it say about divorce? And, and you know, the, within the scriptures what the lord you know the scriptures are a book of love so that is the underlying principle how do we love people as they go through this how do they know that no matter what or how ugly this is going to get my church loves and supports me someone here put it you know very clearly don't take sides we're not supposed to take sides you know we are representing you know jesus christ 
And as far as he's concerned, you know, love covers a multitude of sins, including people who are going through divorce. And I'm not saying that they're sin or they're sinners. I'm just saying that it covers even tough situations like that. So yes, we have much uh, growth to do, much grace to extend as the church. And, um, and I would want to say is that the church is maturing in this area, but um, we, 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 can, we can support people a lot more. We can love people a lot more. Yeah. Thank you for uh, bringing that uh, uh, out, Jackie, because mm -hmm. it's one thing that uh, is really affecting many people, uh, church and uh, how they treat the people who've gone through uh, divorce or separation. And you would really want to appreciate uh, uh, some of the churches in in, uh, in town that have really taken it up to work with the people who are going through divorce by offering uh, support and uh, healing programs. So we would really pray that even other churches, other pastors will take it up so that uh, we get to a point of just making these people uh, whole again after going through that pain. Maybe um, as we come to and then I can see our time is really gone. Uh, Coach, you can give your comment on that, uh, uh, a divorce and the church. And also, there's also one comment for you that you, you can uh, just pass by. And there's uh, one person who, who has, talk, uh, has spoken about, uh, even at older age, uh, they still, there are people who still don't get to the connection point, you know, the right. quality and the connection that you're talking about. So maybe you, you can also just give a comment on that as you talk uh, about church and uh, divorces. Thank you very much, Madam. Yes, what Reverend has said is true. Uh, the church has not shown grace towards divorced people. Now, imagine a woman who has gone through years of domestic violence and she has walked out because she's fearing for her life. And then she comes to church, and first and foremost, the church leadership frowns upon divorce, and the church members are professionals in gossiping divorced people. So it's somebody out of the frying pan into the fire. Imagine going to a hospital saying you have a headache and the doctors tell, tell, tell you we don't have medicine for headache. In fact, they start mocking you because of your headache. What would you do? We have pushed people back into the arms of the devil. And we need to go to a place where the church will get to a place where we look at people with the eyes of God. Empathy. Have compassion towards these people. This thing of, as Reverend was saying, Vumilia, many people have died because of that statement. We will pray. We will pray. You are being beaten like a punching bag and people are interceding. And in fact, let me tell you today, if 10 believers tell you they are praying for you, only one is praying for you. The biggest lie most believers say is that we are praying for you. We are praying for you. And then when you die, they will wear black shades and black outfits with your photo on, on their, on their t-shirts. And then they are saying, God loved you most. Yet, many have stayed in toxic marriages for fear of being judged in church. We know many churches have, a few of the churches have divorce care. And I say kudos to those churches. And I think many people must come to that place. Where, and, and she says, let me tell you, divorce is like a death. Let me, let me tell you something without fear. When you're going through the divorce, you throw, okay, you throw hands at each other, and I'm, I'm being called now to go to the studio. You throw hands at each other. And then when you're finally given the decree absolute, which is the divorce, the final divorce paper, it's like a death. Nobody walks into marriage with a view of divorce. Divorce happens, but people have left each other because of various issues. But the church embraced these divorced people. Let's discuss these things on the pulpit. If church leadership can, can show compassion, let all it will now trickle down to the members and say, okay, if this is what is being said, like you see what Reverend has said from a position of an authority in the church, you know, uh, where the, the, the Bible will allow for divorce and domestic violence, infidelity and all those things. If people who are under hand listen to the Reverend saying that, they will automatically show compassion to the other people who are divorced. Divorced people are human beings. And I finish with this statement. Divorce is the marriage is not a qualification for heaven. Divorce will not take you to hell. God bless you. Allow me now to go to the studio. Catch me on TV 47 as we discuss some crazy stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Coach, for your time. God bless thank you. you. God bless Good to Asante. see you again. Yeah. Thank you, Rev. We'll talk. Yeah, okay. right. <laughs> yeah, Jackie, you can also give your parting shot as we uh, wrap up this session and also just appreciating for making time to come and uh, for the deep insights that you have given on this uh, show. We really, really appreciate. Yeah. 
Well, my part in short is is uh, is a simple one um, because the, I mean the topic we were discussing was dating in your forties and plus the challenges. Um, I always say this: live life, enjoy the season that you're in. You know, have good friends, have great relationships. You know, um, have a life that is full, a life that has purpose, a life that has focus and direction. Live the best life that you can live. Um, if you if you are always looking over your shoulder, wondering what could be, you know, what are my options, you will miss out a lot on having a really good quality life. And so even if you're in the 40s when, you know, people, you know, go on dates, go, go out, enjoy yourself. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the people that you'll be meeting. But live a life. Because I, I, I live by this scripture, John chapter 10, verse 10, the second part, where Jesus is speaking. And he says, I have come that you might have life and have life abundantly. Yes, so even if you're single and in your 40s, 50s, have an abundant life. That's my parting shot. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Jackie for that. That's very, very deep. And uh, also before I give my parting shot, I would also want to appreciate our viewers, uh, our audience for, uh, for uh, keeping it here. Thank you for your comments, your questions, your contribution towards this show. We always appreciate you and may God bless you so much. Uh, my uh, parting shot, uh, I'll give a quote uh, by BC Blade uh, that he said, contentment as an individual is the clue or evidence that you are clearly mature enough to choose a partner correctly. Yeah, now uh, with that, I would like just to uh, mention uh, as Adref Africa, there are a few programs that we also offer. We, uh, we offer healing uh, uh, programs, we offer counseling sessions, we offer legal awareness programs. So kindly check it uh, out on our website uh, in case you need any of those uh, uh, programs. Until we meet again next month, I've been your host, Jenny Washira. Have a blessed night. And I would ask uh, Reverend kindly just pray for us as we close this session. It will be my honor. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had having this difficult conversation for many people. But we thank you that by your spirit, you've been here. You've helped us tackle some difficult areas. You've helped us see some humor in, uh, in what it means to be single in your 40s, 50s and dating. And I pray for everyone who's listening in or will listen in to this um, recording that they would find fulfillment in whatever season of life that they're in. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank it's a joy you. and a pleasure to be here with you and to interact with your audience. Uh, I've enjoyed my evening. Asante sana. God bless you so much. And